Book 5. A hero strives with gods now Diomed hour for great action came. Athena made him bold, and gave him ease to tower amid Argives, to win glory, and on his shield and helm she kindled fire most like midsummer's purest flaming star in heaven rising, bathed by the ocean stream. So fiery she made his head and shoulders as she impelled him to the center where the greatest number fought. A certain dares, a noble man among the Trojans, rich, and a votary of Hephaestos, had two sons well trained in warfare, Phegeus and Ideos. These two the Achaean faced as they came forward upon their car, on foot he braced to meet them. As the range narrowed, Phegeus aimed and cast his long spear first, the point cleared Diomedes' shoulder on the left, and failed to touch him. Then Diomedes wheeling in his turn let fly his bronze-shod spear. No miss, but a clean hit midway between the nipples knocked the man backward from his team. Ideos left the beautiful chariot, leaping down, but dared not stand his ground over his brother, nor could he have himself eluded death unless Hephaestos had performed the rescue, hiding him in darkness thus to spare his father full bereavement. Were he lost? Yanking the horses' heads, lashing their flanks, Diomedes handed team and chariot over to men of his command to be conducted back to the ships. Now when the Trojans saw how Dare's two sons fared one saved indeed, the other lying dead beside his car every man's heart misgave him. Grey-eyed Athena took the fierce war-god, Ares, by the hand and said to him, Ares, bane of all mankind, crusted with blood, breacher of city walls, why not allow the Trojans and Achaeans to fight alone? Let them contend why not, for glory Zeus may hold out to the winner, while we keep clear of combat and his rage. Even as she spoke she led him from the battle and sat him down upon Scamander's side. Now Danans forced back the Trojan lines and every captain killed his man. First the Lord Marshal Agamemnon struck from his car Odios, a tall warrior, chief of the Halizones, he had turned, signaling a retreat. When Agamemnon's point went through him from the rear, between the shoulders, driving through his chest, and down he crashed with clang of arms upon him. Idomeneus then killed the son of Boros, Phaistos, who came from good farmland at Tarn. As this man rose upon his car, Idomeneus drove through his right shoulder, tumbling him out of the chariot, and numbing darkness shrouded him, as the Cretans took his gear. Scamandrios, hunter son of Strophios, fell before Menelaos. Point Scamandrios, expert at hunting, Artemis herself had taught him to bring down all kinds of game bred in the forests on wild hills. But she who fills the air with arrows helped him not at all this time, nor did his own good shooting. No, as he ran before the Achaeans Lance Menelaos caught him with a lunging thrust between the shoulder blades, drove through his ribs, and down he fell, head first, his armor clanging. Meanwhile Marians killed Phereclos, son of Harmonides, a man who knew all manner of building art and handicraft, for Pallas Athena loved him well. This man had even built Alexandros those ships, vessels of evil, fatal to the Trojans, and now to him, who had not guessed heaven's will. Running behind and overtaking him, Marians hit his buttock on the right and pierced his bladder, missing the pelvic bone. He fell, moaning, upon his hands and knees and death shrouded him. Then Medjus killed Pideos, bastard son of Lord Antenor, a son whom Lady Theano had cherished equally with her own, to please her husband. Medjus Phileides, the master spearman, closing with him, hit his nape, the point clove through his tongue's root and against his teeth. Biting cold bronze he fell into the dust. Eurepilos Euaemonides brought down Hypsenor, son of noble Delopian, priest of Scamander in the old time, honored by countryfolk as though he were a god. As this man fled, Eurypilos leapt after him with drawn sword, on the run, and struck his shoulder, cutting away one heavy arm, in blood the arm dropped, and death surging on his eyes took him, hard destiny. So toiled the Achaeans in that rough charge. But as for Diomedes, you could not tell if he were with Achaeans or Trojans, for he coursed along the plain most like an April torrent fed by snow, a river in flood that sweeps away his bank, no piled-up dike will hold him, no revetment shielding the bloom of orchard land, this river suddenly at crest when heaven pours down the rain of Zeus, many a yeoman's field of beautiful grain is ravaged, even so before Diomedes were the crowded ranks of Trojans broken, many as they were, and none could hold him. Now when Pandaros looked over at him, saw him sweep the field, 
he bent his bow of horn at Diomedes and shot him as he charged, hitting his cuirass in the right shoulder joint. The winging arrow stuck, undeflected, spattering blood on bronze. Pandaros gave a great shout, close up, Trojans. Come on, charioteers. The Achaean champion is hit, hit hard, I swear my arrow shot will bring him down soon if indeed it was Apollo who cheered me on my way from Lycia. Triumphantly he shouted, but his arrow failed to bring Diomedes down. Retiring upon his chariot and team, he stood and said to Sthenelos, the son of Capaneus, quick, Sthenelos, old friend, jump down and pull this jabbing arrow from my shoulder. Sthenelos vaulted down and, pressed against him, drew the slim arrow shaft clear of his wound with spurts of blood that stained his knitted shirt. And now at last Diomedes of the warcry prayed aloud, O oh, hear me, daughter of Zeus who bears the storm cloud, tireless one, Athena. If ever you stood near my father and helped him in a hot fight, befriend me now as well. Let me destroy that man, bring me in range of him, who hit me by surprise and glories in it. He swears I shall be blind to sunlight soon. So ran his prayer, and Pallas Athena heard him. Nimbleness in the legs, sure feet and hands she gave him, standing near him, saying swiftly, Courage, Diomedes. Press the fight against the Trojans. Fury like your father's I put into your heart, his never quailed Tydeus, master shields man, master of horses. I've cleared away the mist that blurred your eyes a moment ago, so you may see before you clearly, and distinguish God from man. If any god should put you to the test upon this field, be sure you are not the man to dare immortal gods in combat none, that is, except the goddess Aphrodite. If ever she should join the fight, then wound her with your keen bronze. At this, grey-eyed Athena left him, and once more he made his way into the line. If he had burnt before to fight with Trojans, now indeed bloodlust three times as furious took hold of him. Think of a lion that some shepherd wounds, but lightly as he leaps into a fold. The man who roused his might cannot repel him but dives into his shelter, while his flocks, abandoned, are all driven wild, in heaps huddled they are to lie, torn carcasses, before the escaping lion at one bound surmounts the palisade. So lion-like, Diomedes plunged on Trojans. First he killed Astinus and a captain, Hypiron, one with a spear thrust in the upper chest, the other by a stroke of his great sword chopping his collarbone at the round joint to sever his whole shoulder from his body. These he left, and met Polyados and Abbas, Eurydama's sons, the father being an old interpreter of dreams. He read no dreams for these two, going to war, Diomedes killed and stripped them. Next he met Xanthos and Thun, two dear sons of Phanops, a man worn out with misery and years who fathered no more heirs, but these Diomedes overpowered, he took their lives, leaving their father empty pain and mourning never to welcome them alive at home after the war and all their heritage broken up among others. Next two sons of Dardan Priam Diomedes killed in one war car, Echemon and Chromios. Just as a lion leaps to crunch the neck of ox or heifer, grazing near a thicket, Diomedes, leaping, dragged them down convulsed out of their car, and took their armor, sending their horses to the rear. Aeneas, observing all the havoc this man made amid the Trojan ranks, moved up the line of battle, and along the clash of spears, in search of Pindaros. Coming upon him, he halted by Lycaon's noble son and said to him, Pandaros, where is your bow? Where are your fledged arrows? And your fame? No man of Troy contends with you in archery, no man in Lycia would claim to beat you. Here, lift your hands to Zeus, let fly at that one, whoever he is. An overwhelming fighter, he has already hurt the Trojans badly, cutting down many of our best. Let fly. Unless it be some god who bears a grudge against us, raging over a sacrifice. The anger of a god is cruel anger. To this Lycaon's noble son replied, Aeneas, master of battlecraft for Trojans under arms, that spearman, as I see him, looks very like Diomedes, shield and helm with his high plume socket I recognize, having his team in view. I cannot swear he is no god. If it be Diomedes, never could he have made this crazy charge without some god behind him. No, some god is near him wrapped in cloud, and bent aside that arrowhead that reached him for I shot him once before, I hit him, too, and squarely on the right shoulder threw his cuirass joint over the armpit. Down to the ditch of death I thought I had dispatched him. Not at all, my arrow could not bring him down. 
some angry god is in this. Teams and chariots I lack, or I could ride. In father's manor there are eleven war cars newly built and outfitted, with housings on them all, and every chariot has a team nearby that stands there champing barley meal. God knows how many things Lycaon had to tell me in the great hall before I left. He said that I could drive a team, a chariot, and so command the Trojan men-at-arms in combat. How much better if I had? But I refused, sparing the teams, I thought, from short rations of fodder under siege. And so I left them, made my way on foot to Ilion, relying on my bow about destined to fail me. In this battle I have had shots at two great fighters, one Diomedes and the other Manelios, I drew blood from both, but only roused them. Destiny was against me on that day I took my bow of horn down from its peg, and led my men to your sweet town of Troy for Hector's sake. If ever I return, if ever I lay eyes on land and wife and my great hall, may someone cut my head off unless I break this bow between my hands and throw it into a blazing fire. It goes everywhere with me, useless. Aeneas said, better not talk so. Till we act, he wins. We too can drive my car against this man and take him on with sword and spear. Mount my chariot, and you'll see how fast these horses of the line of Tros can run, they know our plane, and how to will upon it this way, and that way in pursuit or flight like wind veering. These will save us, take us Troy ward if again Zeus should confer the upper hand and glory on Diomedes. Come take the whip and reins, and let me mount to fight him from the car, or you yourself may face the man, and let me mind the horses. Lycaon's noble son replied, Aeneas, manage the reins yourself, and guide the team, they'll draw the rounded war car with Maurice knowing the driver, if we must give ground to Diomedes this time. God forbid they panic, missing your voice, and balk at pulling out when Diomedes makes his leap upon us. God forbid he kill the two of us and make a prize of these. No, you yourself handle your car and team. I'll take him on with my good spear when he attacks. So both agreed and rode the painted car toward Diomedes. Sthenelos, the son of Capaneus, caught sight of them and turned at once to Diomedes, saying, Friend of my heart and soul, I see two spearmen who would have your blood, a pair of big men, bearing down on you. One's Pandaros the bowman, by repute his father was Lycaon, and the other, Aeneas, claims Ancuses as his father, his mother is Aphrodite. Up with you. We'll move back somewhat in our chariot. Now is no moment for another charge, or you may lose your life. But Diomedes glanced at him scowling. No more talk, he said, of turning tail. You cannot make me see it. For me there's no style in a dodging fight or making oneself small. I am fresh as ever. Retire in the car? I dread it. No, I'll meet them head on as before. Athena will never let me tremble. These two men are not to get away behind their horses after we hit them, even if one survives to try it. Let me tell you this thing too, remember it. If in her craft Athena confers on me the honor of killing both, you halt our horses hard upon the spot, taking a full hitch round the chariot rail, and jump Aeneas' horses, mind you drive them among Achaeans, out of the Trojans' range. They are that breed that Zeus who views the wide world gave to Tros and Fee for Ganymedes, under the dawn and under Helios the finest horses in the world. Ancuses, marshal of Troy, stole their great stock without Laomedon's knowledge, putting fillies to breed with them, and from these half a dozen foals were bred for Ancuses at his manor. For to be reared in his own stalls, but two he gave Aeneas as a battle team. If we can take the team we win great honor. This was the way these two conferred. Meanwhile the other pair behind their team full tilt had come in range, and Pandaros called out, O son of Tydeus, undaunted heart and mind of war, my arrow could not bring you down a wasted shot. This time I'll try a spear. God, let me hit you. Rifling it, he let the long spear fly and struck him on the shield. His point in flight broke through to reach the cuirass and Pandaros gave a great shout, now you're hit square in the midriff. Can you keep your feet? Not long, I think. This time the glory's mine. Unshaken by the blow, Diomedes answered, a miss, no hit. I doubt you two will quit though, being what you are, till one of you is down and glutting leather-covered Ares, god of battle, with your blood. At this he made his cast, 
his weapon being guided by Athena to cleave Pandaro's nose beside the eye and shatter his white teeth, his tongue the brazen spearhead severed, tipped from root, then plowing on came out beneath his chin. He toppled from the car, and all his armor clanged on him, shimmering. The horses quivered and shied away, but life and spirit ebbed from the broken man, and he lay still. With shield and spear Aeneas, now on foot, in dread to see the Achaeans drag the dead man, came and best rode him, like a lion at bay. Keeping the spear and rounded shield before him, thrusting to kill whoever came in range, he raised a terrible cry. But Diomedes bent for a stone and picked it up a boulder no two men now alive could lift, though he could heft it easily. This mass he hurled and struck Aeneas on the hip, just where the hip bone shifts in what they call the bone cup, crushing this joint with two adjacent tendons under the skin ripped off by the rough stone. Now the great Trojan, fallen on his knees, put all his weight on one strong hand and leaned against the earth, night veiled his eyes. Aeneas would have perished there but for the quickness of the daughter of Zeus, his mother, Aphrodite, she who bore him to shepherding Ancuses. And who now pillowed him softly in her two white arms and held a corner of her glimmering robe to screen him, so that no Danian spear should stab and finish him. Then from the battle heavenward she lifted her dear son. Meanwhile Sthenelos, the son of Capaneus, remembered the command of Diomedes. He brought his horses to a halt, made fast his taut reins to the chariot rail, and flung himself upon Aeneas' long-maned beautiful team. Away, out of the Trojans' reach, he drove them, and gave them into Diepolo's hands for he esteemed this friend more than his peers for presence of mind to lead them to the ships. Remounting, shaking out his polished reins, he turned his sure-footed horses and drove hard in Diomedes' track as Diomedes moved ahead to attack the Cyprian goddess. He knew her to be weak, not one of those divine mistresses of the wars of Menathena, for example, or Enyo, raider of cities therefore he dared assail her through a great ruck of battle. When in range he leaped high after her, and with his point wounded her trailing hand, the brazen lancehead slashed her heavenly robe, worked by the graces, and cut the tender skin upon her palm. Now from the goddess that immortal fluid, Ikor, flowed the blood of blissful gods who eat no food, who drink no tawny wine, and thereby being bloodless have the name of being immortal. Aphrodite screamed and flung her child away, but Lord Apollo caught him in his arms and bore him off in a dark cloud, so no Danon spear should stab and finish him. Now Diomedes, lord of the battle cry, with mighty lungs cried out to her, O oh, give up war, give up war and killing, goddess. Is it not enough to break soft women down with coaxing lust? Go haunting battle, will you? I can see you shudder after this at the name of war. So taunted, faint with pain, she quit the field, being by wind running Iris helped away in anguish, sobbing, while her lovely skin ran darkness. Then she came on Ares resting far to the left, his spears half leaning on a bank of mist, there stood his battle team, and falling on one knee she begged her brother for those gold bangled horses. Brother dear, please let me take your team, do let me have them, to go up to the gods' home on Olympos. I am too dreadfully hurt, a mortal speared me. Diomedes it was, he'd even fight with Zeus. Then Ares gave her his gold bangled team, and into the car she stepped, throbbing with pain, while Iris at her side gathered the reins and flicked the horses into eager flight. They came, almost at once, to steep Olympos where the gods dwell. Iris who runs on wind halted and unyoked the team and tossed them heavenly fodder. In Dion's lap Aphrodite sank down, and her dear mother held and caressed her, whispering in her ear, Who did this to you, darling child? In heaven who could have been so rude and wild, as though you had committed open wrong? And Aphrodite, lover of smiling eyes, answered, Diomedes had the insolence to wound me, when I tried to save my dear son from the war, Aeneas, dearest of all the sons of men to me. It seems this horrid combat is no longer Trojans against Achaeans now, the Argives are making war upon the gods themselves. Then said Dion, loveliest of goddesses, there, child, patience, even in such distress. Many of us who live upon Olympos have taken hurt from men and hurt each other. Ares bore it, when Odos and Ephialtes, Aloeus' giant sons, put him in chains, he lay for thirteen moons in a brazen jar, until that glutton of war might well have perished had Araboia, their stepmother, not told Hermes, Hermes broke him free more. Dead than alive, worn out by the iron chain. 
Then think how Hera suffered too, when Amphitryon's mighty son let fly his triple barbed arrow into her right breast, unappeasable pain came over her. And Aids, great lord of undergloom, bore a shot from the same strong son of Zeus at Pylos, amid the dead. That arrow stroke delivered him to anguish. Then Aids, pierced and stricken, went to high Olympos, the arrow grinding still in his great shoulder, and their pion with a poultice healed him who was not born for death. What recklessness in Heracles, champion though he was at labors, to shrug at impious acts and bend his bow for the discomfiture of Olympians. But this man, he that wounded you, Athena put him up to it idiot, not to know his days are numbered who would fight the gods. His children will not sing around his knees Papa. Papa on his return from war. So let Diomedes pause, for all his prowess, let him remember he may meet his match, and Aegealia, Adresto's daughter, starting up from sleep some night in tears may waken all the house, missing her husband, noblest of Achaeans, Diomedes. Dion soothed her, wiped away the ichor with both hands from Aphrodite's palm already throbbing less, already healing. But Hera and Athena, looking on, had waspish things to say, to irritate Zeus. It was the grey-eyed goddess who began, Oh father, will you be annoyed if I make a small comment? Aphrodite likes to beguile the women of Achaia to elope with Trojans, whom she so adores, now, fondling some Achaean girl, I fear, she scratched her slim white hand on a golden pin. He smiled at this, the father of gods and men, and said to the pale gold goddess Aphrodite, Warfare is not for you, child. Lend yourself to sighs of longing and the marriage bed. Let Ares and Athena deal with war. These were the colloquies in heaven. Meanwhile, Diomedes, lord of the war cry, charged Aeneas though he knew well Apollo had sustained him. He feared not even the great god himself, but meant to kill Aeneas and take his armor. Three times he made his killing thrust, three times the lord Apollo buffeted his shield, throwing him back. Beside himself, again he sprang, a fourth time, but the archer god raised a blood-curdling cry, look out. Give way. Enough of this, this craze to vie with gods. Our kind, immortals of the open sky, will never be like yours, earth-faring men. Diomedes backed away a step or two before Apollo's terrible anger, and the god caught up Aeneas and set him down on Troy's high citadel of Pergamos where his own shrine was built. There in that noble room Leto and Artemis tended the man and honored him. Meanwhile Apollo made a figure of illusion, Aeneas double, armed as he was armed, and round this phantom Trojans and Achaeans cut one another's chest protecting oxhide shields with hanging shield flaps. Then Apollo said to the war god, bane of all mankind, crusted with blood, breather of walls, why not go in and take this man out of the combat, this Diomedes, who would try a cast with Zeus himself. First he attempted Cypris and cut her lovely hand, then like a fury came at me. Apollo turned away to rest in Pergamos, upon the height, while baleful Ares through the ranks of Trojans made his way to stiffen them. He seemed Akamas, a good runner, chief of Thracians, appealing to the sons of Priam, princes, heirs of Priam and the line of Zeus, how long will the Achaeans have your leave to kill your people? Up to the city gates? Lying in dust out there is one of us whom we admire as we do Lord Hector Aeneas, noble Ancus's son. Come, we can save him from the trampling rout. He made them burn at this, and then Sarpedon in his turn growled at Hector, What of you, Hector, where has your courage gone? Defend the city, will you, without troops, without allies, you and your next of kin, brothers-in-law and brothers? In the combat I neither see nor hear of them like dogs making themselves scarce around a lion. We do the fighting, we who are allies here as I am and a long journey, I made of it from Lycia and Xantho's eddying river far away, where I left wife and child, with property a needy man would dream of. Here all the same I am, sending my Lycians forward, and going in to fight myself, though I have no least stake in Troy, no booty for Achaeans to carry off while you stand like a sheep. You have not even called on the rest to hold their ground, to fight for their own wives. Will you be netted, caught like helpless game your enemies can feast on? They will be pillaging your city soon. Here is your duty, night and day press every captain of your foreign troops to keep his place in battle, and fight off the blame and bitterness of your defeat. This lashing had made Hector hot with shame, and down he vaulted from his chariot, hefting two spears, to pace up through the army, flank and center, 
calling on all to fight, to join battle again. The Trojans rallied and now stood off the Achaeans, while the Achaeans kept formation too. See in the mines I wind blowing chaff on ancient threshing floors when men with fans toss up the trodden sheaves, and yellow haired Demeter, puff by puff, divides the chaff and grain, how all day long in bleaching sun straw piles grow white, so white grew those Achaean figures and the dust cloud churned to the brazen sky by horses' hooves as chariots intermingled, as the drivers turned and turned carrying their hands high and forward gallantly despite fatigue. Now coming to the Trojans' aid in battle, Ares veiled them everywhere in dusk, obeying Apollo of the golden sword by rousing Trojan courage, he had seen Pallas Athena, defender of Danans, depart from the other side. Apollo then out of his sanctum, hushed and hung with gold, sent back the marshal of Trojan troops, Aeneas, with fighting spirit restored. He stood again amid his peers, to their relief. They saw him whole, without a scratch, and hot for war but no one there could pause to question him. Apollo brought new toil upon them now with Ares, bane of men and strife insatiable. Amid the Achaeans those two men named Aias, joining Diomedes and Odysseus, made bastion for Danans. See these four, all fearless of attack or Trojan power, patient in battle motionless as clouds that Zeus may station on high mountaintops in a calm heaven, while the north wind sleeps and so do all the winds whose gusty blowing rifts and dispels shade-bearing cloud. So these Danans held their ground against the Trojans and never stirred, while Agamemnon passed amid the ranks haranguing troops, dear friends, be men, choose valor and pride in one another when shock of combat comes. More men of pride are saved than lost, and men who run for it get no reward of praise, no safety either. Lightning quick, he lunged with his own spear and hit Aeneas' friend, Daikun, Pergaso's son, spearfighter, a man the Trojans honored as they did their princes, knowing him prompt to join the battle line. His shield hit hard by Agamemnon's thrust could not withstand the spearhead, but the point drove through his belt low down and crumpled him, with clang of arms upon him. Aeneas now, for his part, killed two champions of the Danans, Orsilokos and Crethon, sons of Diocles, who owned estates in fear, being descended from that river that runs broad through the Pilian land, Alpheos. Alpheos fathered Lord Ortolokos, powerful over many men, and he in his turn fathered gallant Diocles, whose sons were twins, Orsilokos and Crethon, skillful at every kind of fight. Still fresh in manhood they embarked in the black ships for the wild horse country of Ilion, to gain vengeance for the Atridae, Agamemnon, and Menelaos. Here death hid them both. Imagine two young lions, reared by a mother lioness in undergrowth of a deep mountain forest twins who prey on herds and flocks, despoiling farms, till one day they too are torn to pieces, both at once, by sharp spears in the hands of men. So these went down before the weapons of Aeneas, falling like lofty pines before an axe. Pitying the two men fallen, Menelaos came up, formidable in glittering bronze, with menacing spear for Ares urged him on to see him conquered at Aeneas' hands. But Nestor's watchful son, Antilochos, advanced to join him, anxious for his captain, fearing his loss and failure of their cause. The two champions with weapons tilted up had faced each other, when Antilochos moved in, shoulder to shoulder, with Menelaos, an agile fighter though he was, Aeneas shunned the combat, measuring this pair. On his retreat they pulled away the dead unlucky twins and passed them to the rear, then turned again to battle. First they killed a captain of Paphlagonians, Pylamines, burly as Ares, Menelaos it was who hit him with a spear thrust, pierced him through just at the collarbone. Antilochos knocked out his driver, a Timnio's noble son called Maidon. As the man wheeled his horses a boulder smashed his elbow, in the dust his reins, inset with ivory, curled out, as with drawn sword Antilochos leapt on him and gashed his forehead. Gasping, down he went, head first, pitching from his ornate car, into a sandbank so his luck would have it to stay embedded till his trampling horses rolled him farther in the dust. Antilochos lashed at them and consigned them to the rear. Surveying these Achaeans through the ranks Hector charged with a sudden cry. Beside him strong Trojan formations moved ahead, impelled by Ares and by cold Enyo who brings the shameless butchery of war. Ares wielding a gigantic spear by turns led Hector on or backed him up, and as he watched this figure, Diomedes felt like a traveler halted on a plain, helpless to cross, before a stream and flood that roars and spumes down to the sea. That traveler would look once and recoil, 
So Diomedes backed away and said to his company, friends, all we can do is marvel at Prince Hector. What a spearman he is and what a fighter. One of the gods goes with him everywhere to shield him from a mortal wound. Look. There, beside him Ares in disguise. Give ground slowly, keep your faces toward the Trojans. No good pitting ourselves against the gods. The Trojans reached them as he spoke, and Hector swept into death a pair of men who knew the joy of war Menestes and Anchialos both in a single car. Now, these two fallen were pitted by great Aias Telemonios, who moved in close, his glittering spear at play, and overcame Silego's son, Amphion, a landowner in Pisos. Destiny had sent this man to take a stand with Priam and Priam's sons in war. Now Aias thrust went through his belt, and in his lower belly the spear point crunched and stuck. He fell hard in the dust. Then Aias came up fast to strip him, while the Trojans cast their spears in a bright hail, his shield took one shock after another. With one heel braced on the corpse he pulled away his point, but being beset by spears he could not slip sword belt or buckler from the dead man's shoulders. And now, too, he began to be afraid of Trojans coming up around the body, brave men and many, pressing him with spears. Big as he was, and powerful and bold, they pushed him back, and he retired, shaken. This way the toil of battle took its course in that quarter. Elsewhere, all-powerful fate moved Heracles' great son, Plepolemos, to meet Sarpedon. As they neared each other, son and grandson of cloud-massing Zeus, Plepolemos began to jeer, Lycian, war counselor Sarpedon, why so coy upon this field? You call yourself a fighter? They lie who say you come of Zeus' line, you are so far inferior to those fathered by Zeus among the men of old. Think what the power of Heracles was like, my lion-hearted father. For Laomedon's chariot horses once he beached at Troy with only six shiploads of men, a handful, yet he sacked Ilion and left her ways desolate. But your nerve is gone, your troops are losing badly, it is no gain for Trojans that you came here from Lycia, powerful man that you are, and when you fall to me, down through the gates of death you go. Sarpedon answered, right enough, Tlepolemos, he did ruin Ilion, Laomedon, the greedy fool, gave him a vicious answer after great labor well performed refused to make delivery of the promised horses that Heracles had come for. As for you, I promise a hard lot, a bloody death you'll find here on this battleground, when my spear knocks you out. You'll give up glory to me and life to him who drives the horses of undergloom, aids. Then Tlepolemos raised his ashen spear, and from their hands in unison long shafts took flight. Sarpedon's hit his enemy squarely in the neck with force enough to drive the point clear through, unending night of death clouded his eyes. Tlepolemos' point, hitting the upper leg, went jolting through between the two long bones, but once again Sarpedon's father saved him. Out of the melee men of his command carried the captain in his agony, encumbered by the long dragging spear. No one had time to think of how the shaft might be withdrawn, that he might use one leg at least, so hastily they did their work, so pressed by care of battle. Meanwhile Tlepolemos was carried back by the Achaeans on the other side. Rugged Odysseus noted it with anger and pain for him. What should he do, he thought, track down Sarpedon, son of thundering Zeus, or take the life of Lycians and throngs? But it was not the destiny of brave Odysseus with his sharp spear to finish off Sarpedon, but Athena turned his fury upon the Lycians. He killed Koiranos, Iaster, Chromios, Alcandros, Halios, Noman, Pritanes, and would have killed more Lycians, had not great Hector's piercing eye under his shimmering helmet lighted on him. Across the clashing line he came a glitter with burning bronze, a terror to Danaeans, making Sarpedon's heart lift up to see him, so that as Hector passed he weakly said, I beg you not to leave me lying here for Danans to despoil. Defend me, afterward let me bleed away my life within your city. Not for me to see my home and country once again, my dear wife and her joy, my little son. Silent under his polished helmet, Hector, dazzling and impetuous, passed on to drive the Argives back with general slaughter, and those around Sarpedon laid their commander in the royal shade of Zeus Oak. One dear to him, Pelagon, worrying the spearhead, pulled it from his thigh, at which he fainted. But his breath came back when a cool north wind, a reprieve, blew round and fanned him, waken him from his black swoon. Even though not yet routed to the ships under attack from Ares and from Hector, 
the Argives could not gain, but yielded everywhere, knowing that Ares fought among the Trojans. One by one, who were the fighting men that Hector slew and Ares? Tothra's first Orestes, breaker of horses, a spear thrower, Trechos, an Aetolian, Oinomaeos, Helenos Oinopides, Oresbios whose plated breastband glittered, in the past he lived at Hyle on Lake Cafisos, fond of his wealth, amid his countrymen, Boeotians of the fertile plain. Now Hera, seeing these Argives perish in the fight, appealed with indignation to Athena, a dismal scene, this. O untiring goddess, daughter of mighty Zeus who bears the storm cloud, our word to Menelaos was a fraud that he should never sail for home before he plundered Ilion. How likely, if we allow this lunatic attack by that sinister fool Ares? Come, we'll put our minds on our own fighting power. Grey-eyed Athena listened and agreed, and Hera, eldest daughter of old Kronos, harnessed her team, all golden fringes. He be fitted upon her chariot, left and right, the brazen wheels with eight shinbones, or spokes, around the iron axletree, all gold her fellows are, unworn, for warped upon them are tires of bronze, a marvel, and the hubs are silver, turning smoothly on each side. The car itself is made of gold and silver woven together, with a double rail, and from the car a silver chariot pole leans forward. He be fitted to the tip a handsome golden yoke, and added collars all soft gold. And Hera in her hunger for strife of battle, and the cries of war backed her sure-footed horses in the traces. As for Athena, she cast off and dropped her great brocaded robe, her handiwork, in lapping folds across her father's doorsill, taking his shirt, the shirt of Zeus, cloud masser, with breast armor, and gear of grievous war. She hung the storm cloud shield with reveled tassels ominous from her shoulder, all around upon it in a garland rout was figured, enmity, force, and chase that chills the blood, concentered on the gorgon's head, reptilian seething fear a portent of the storm king. Quadruple crested, golden, double ridged her helmet was, and chased with men at arms put by a hundred cities in the field. She stepped aboard the glowing car of Hera, and took the great haft of her spear in hand that heavy spear this child of power can use to break in wrath long battle lines of fighters. Then at the crack of Hera's whip over the horses' backs, the gates of heaven swung wide of themselves on rumbling hinges gates the hours keep, for they have charge of entry to wide heaven and Olympos by opening or closing massive cloud. Passing through these and goading on their team, the goddesses encountered Kronos' son, who sat apart from all the gods on the summit of Olympos. Reigning in, Hera with arms as white as ivory addressed the All-Highest, Father Zeus, are you not thoroughly sick of Ares? All those brutal acts of his? How great, how brave the body of Achaeans he destroyed so wantonly, he has made me grieve, while Kypris and Apollo take their pleasure egging on that dunce who knows no decency. Father, you cannot, can you, be annoyed if I chastise and chase him from the field? Then Zeus who gathers cloud replied, go after him. Athena, hope of soldiers, is the one to match with him, she has a wondrous way of bringing him to grief. At this permission, Hera cracked her whip again. Her team went racing between starry heaven and earth. As much dim distance as a man perceives from a high lookout over wine dark sea, these horses neighing in the upper air can take it a bound. Upon the Trojan plain where the two rivers run, Skamaster flowing to confluence with Simois, Hera halted to let her horses graze. Around them both she reigned an emanation of dense cloud, while for their pasturing Simois made ambrosial grass grow soft. The goddesses gliding in a straight line like quivering doves approached the battle to defend the Argives, but once arrived where their best spearmen fought at the flank of Diomedes, giving ground like lions or boars, like carnivores at bay, no feeble victims Hera took her stand with a loud cry. She had the look of Stentor, whose brazen lungs could give a battle shout as loud as fifty soldiers, trumpeting, shame, shame, Argives, cowards. Good on parade. While Prince Achilles roamed the field the Trojans never would show their faces in a sortie, respecting his great spear too much, but now they fight far from the city, near the ships. This shout put anger into them. Meanwhile the grey-eyed goddess Athena from the air hastened to Diomedes. By his car she found him resting, trying to cool the wound Pandaro's arrow gave him. Spent and drenched with sweat beneath his broad shield strap, he felt encumbered by his shield, being arm-weary, and slipped the strap off, wiped his blood away. 
The goddess put her hand upon the yoke that joined his battle team and said, Ah, yes, a far cry from his father, Tydeus' son. Tydeus was a small man, but a fighter. Once I forbade him war or feats of arms, the time he went as messenger to Thebes alone, detached from the Achaean host, amid Cadmians and their multitude. Bidden to dine at ease in their great hall, combative as he always was, he challenged the young Cadmians, and he had no trouble pinning them all, I took his part so well. But you, now here I stand with you, by heaven, protect you, care for you, tell you to fight, but you are either sluggish in the legs from battle weariness or hollow-hearted somehow with fear, you are not, after all, the son of Tydeus Oenides. Proud Diomedes answered her, I know you, goddess, daughter of Zeus who bears the storm cloud. With all respect, I can explain and will. No fear is in me, and no weariness, I simply bear in mind your own commands. You did expressly say I should not face the blissful gods in fight that is, unless Aphrodite came in. One might feel free to wound her anyway. So you commanded, and therefore I am giving ground myself and ordering all the Argives to retire shoulder to shoulder here, because I know the master of battle over there is Ares. The grey-eyed goddess answered, Diomedes, dear to my heart, no matter what I said, you are excused from it, you must not shrink from Ares or from any other god while I am with you. Whip your team toward Ares, hit him, hand to hand, defer no longer to this maniacal god by nature evil, two-faced everywhere. Not one hour ago I heard him grunt his word to Hera and myself to fight on the Argive side, now he forgets all that and joins the Trojans. Even as she spoke, she elbowed Sthenelos aside and threw him, but gave him a quick hand up from the ground, while she herself, impetuous for war, mounted with Diomedes. At her step the oaken axle groaned, having to bear goddess and hero. Formidable Athena caught up the whip and reins and drove the horses hard and straight at Ares. Brute that he was, just at that point he had begun despoiling a giant of a man, the Aetolian's best, Periphas, brilliant scion of Ochesios. The bloodstained god had downed him. But Athena, making herself invisible to Ares, put on the helm of the lord of undergloom. Then Ares saw Diomedes, whirled, and left Periphas lying where he fell. Straight onward for Diomedes lunged the ruffian god. When they arrived in range of one another, Ares, breasting his adversary's horses, rifled his spear over the yoke and reins with murderous aim. Athena, grey-eyed goddess, with one hand caught and deflected it, and sent it bounding harmless from the car. Now Diomedes put his weight behind his own bronze-headed spear. Pallas Athena rammed it at Ares' belted waist so hard she put a gash in his fair flesh, and pulled the spear head out again. Then brazen Ares howled to heaven, terrible to hear as roaring from ten thousand men in battle when long battalions clash. A pang of fear ran through the hearts of Trojans and Achaeans, deafened by insatiable Ares' roar. Like a black vapor from a thunderhead riding aloft on stormwind brewed by heat, so brazen Ares looked to Diomedes as he rose heavenward amid the clouds. High on Olympos, crag of the immortals, he came to rest by the Lord Zeus. Aching, mortified, he showed his bleeding wound and querulously addressed him, Father Zeus, how do you take this insubordination? What frightful things we bear from one another doing good turns to men. And I must say we all hold it against you. You conceived a daughter with no prudence, a destroyer, given to violence. We other gods obey you, as submissive as you please, while she goes unreproved. Never a word, a gesture of correction comes from you only begetter of the insolent child. She is the one who urged Diomedes on to mad attempts on the immortals first he closed with Kypris, cut her palm, and now he hurled himself against me like a fury. It was my speed that got me off, or I should still be there in pain among the dead, the foul dead or undone by further strokes of cutting bronze. But Zeus who masses cloud regarded him with frowning brows and said, Do not come whining here, you two-faced brute, most hateful to me of all the Olympians. Combat and brawling are your element. This beastly, incorrigible truculence comes from your mother, Hera, whom I keep but barely in my power, say what I will. You came to grief, I think, at her command. Still, I will not have you suffer longer. I fathered you, after all, your mother bore you as a son to me. If you had been conceived by any other and born so insolent, then long ago your place would have been far below the gods. With this he told Pion to attend him, 
and sprinkling anodyne upon his wound Pion undertook to treat and heal him who was not born for death. As wild fig sap when dripped in liquid milk will curdle it as quickly as you stir it in, so quickly Pion healed impetuous Ares wound. Then Hebe bathed him, mantled him afresh, and down he sat beside Lord Zeus, glowing again in splendor. And soon again to Zeus home retired Argive Hera, Boeotian Athena, who made the bane of mankind quit the slaughter.